Are you ready to say goodbye to writer's block? Visit books.bookfunnel.com forward slash say goodbye to writer's block. You'll find over 28 ebook resources for writers to help you find inspiration, focus, and success with your writing. Again, books.bookfunnel.com forward slash say goodbye to writer's block. Michael R. French is a best selling multi genre author. His latest novel is Cliffhanger, a suspense thriller. Michael's first published work, which he describes as a throwaway, was released in 1977. His second novel was a bestseller. Despite his early success, he resisted the pressure to stay in one lane. So over the course of a five-decade career, he's written fiction, young adult fiction, adaptations, biographies, art criticisms, and several screenplays. We discuss Michael's lengthy love affair with writing, why characterization is more important than plot, and his thoughts on self-publishing. To learn more, be sure to listen to today's episode of the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. Well, Michael R. French, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller podcast. Thank you. Yeah, so for people who may not know who you are, what would you like to share about yourself? Well, from a from a writing perspective, I've been writing for a long time. Um, I'm probably one of your older guests on your podcast. Uh, I don't think of myself as old, but I've been writing for 50 years. Uh-huh. I published my first novel in 1976, I believe. And I've been writing mostly fiction, on and off since, sometimes young adult fiction, sometimes adult fiction. I've ghostwritten a biography of someone well, well known. I've uh, written art books. I've written self-help books. Uh, I, I'm pretty much uh, an autodidact after college. I mean, if college was necessary, but you, if you don't continually push yourself to learn as much as you can about everything, uh, except maybe particle physics, uh, mm-hmm. you're, you're not going to be the best writer you can be. Um, it's not just about reading novels or it's about being informed about every every subject that you can because in the end there's interrelationships connectivity is is what it's all about hmm. well i imagine that why you started writing over 50 years ago might be different than why you still write today um can you talk about that journey? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, when you're in your late 20s and you're hoping I mean, and you're full of uh, hope and ambition, mm. um, you, you just kind of want to write something that people will say, I, I can publish this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're not trying to write your your magnus opum. Uh, you're just trying to, you know, reach out and see if your words are good enough that another reader, a, an editor, a publisher think so too. So mm-hmm. uh, the very first book I wrote was just kind of a, a throwaway. It was called uh, Club Carib. It was based on my wife and I taking a trip to Club Med mm-hmm. and, and all the stuff, all the stuff that goes on uh, behind the scenes and, and, and during the scenes. And then I, when that got published, I had more confidence and I wrote a book that became a bestseller it was called Abingdon's Doubleday published it. Um, and it was about the department store Bloomingdale's. Mm. And again, it was like, you know, 
what a what a crazy world to be in retail, to be a shopper, to be a buyer, to be a security guard, to be a CEO, um, to be a stylist, uh, the designer. It's like, a, you know, it's very fragile, but um, it's very invigorating, too. So it was easy to fashion a story of suspense mm. uh, all that if you as long as you could do good characters. Mm. And did you find characters <laughs> in just that experience of of going to the store or did you just kind of well you know i mean i think i think writers you know well, create characters from from different methods sometimes i know a lot of a lot of writers like to base a one character in a novel specifically on one person in reality or maybe it's a combination of two or three people in reality mm-hmm. And I, I will do that to a degree just to get started on the character. But in the end, I think I, as a writer, bring my own emotions, mm-hmm. which, like yours or anybody's, runs the gamut from, you know, deep cynicism and skepticism to uh, fantasy, to hope, to anger, uh, to despair, to humor, um, and how you are able to channel those from yourself into the appropriate character that's one of the more challenging things in being a writer Mm, and why is that challenging well i I mean you're you're i'm i'm a believer that character characterization is what you should remember after finishing a book Mm. the plot can get you i'm just talking fiction but a Mm -hmm. plot can get you through from beginning to end and the beginning is important the middle is important. The ending is really important because mm-hmm. the, the plane has to land, you know, very smoothly. No matter how good a takeoff it was, it has to be a good ending. But but after you finish the plot, if you've done your job with characters, the characters are what stay in your mind, and that that's what I always hope. So um, when I was younger, you talked about the younger days. Um, we were all reading um, Catcher in the Rye, right? Mm-hmm. And um, Holden Coalfield, I, I think he's no longer um, au courant among uh, young young readers and writers. But to me, is one of the great characters of American fiction. He's indelible. And so, if you're if I'm creating a book, when I'm finished, I'm going to look at that character and I'm going to say, now is this character going to be meaningful and indelible in a reader's mind, mm-hmm. uh, not just in mine to create it. But I need a reader to complete the process. I could write anything, but without the reader to bookend what I've created, it's kind of meaningless. Yeah. So again, I you know that's that's why characters are so important. Hmm. So what do you? And maybe this is again, this has changed over the years. But like, what do you? Like, how deep do you go? Like, what do you need to know about your character before you can write them? Uh, an ideal situation would be to know your character off on and off the page, particularly off the page. Um, if you can take your character and put him or her in a totally different context than the novel itself, mm-hmm. and you can know, you know, like what kind of food would they order at the restaurant? Um, do they wash their clothes or do they dry clean them? What, what bothers them the most? Things that will never appear in the book but they will help shape the character in your mind. So when the character does appear in the book, he'll have a dimension that's very subtle, but it's effective. Hmm. How do you find that? How do I find that? What the, what the, who the character is off the page. Oh, off the page. Well, yeah, I mean, you're just, you're just kind of making it up. So like in this current book that we're, that we're going to talk about, which Hmm. is called cliffhanger jump before you're pushed. Um, Hmm. There's uh, two high school students running against each other for student body president. And then there's a 60 year old, very wise history teacher. And uh, the, the, I didn't have trouble really envisioning any of them on the surface. But um, if I'm going to take the point of view of an 18 year old senior in high school, now I haven't been there in a long time, but um, you know, I'll I'll find a friend of a, of my son or whatever, and uh, 
they're 18 and I, I kind of try to get to know them and, you know, what they, what the what vocabulary they use, what they talk about, what they're interested in. Are they video gamers? Um, and, you know, sort of create from scratch something that, that when you do translate it to the page, it's um, hopefully it works. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I guess I was leading the question a little bit because it, it ultimately to circle back to what you were saying earlier, right? character is channeling aspects of yourself and your own emotions into right into the lives of the people you're creating. And so um, and to that end, like I imagine that requires figuring out some way to tap into yourself in a way that's maybe not filtering so much. Um, good question. Um, I think my answer to that would be, how do you tap into yourself? Why do you tap into yourself? Yeah. When does that start? Sure. Right? Because, yeah. uh, when does it become habit forming, if you will? In yeah. terms of, um, so it's usually in your teenage years. It certainly was for me. Um, and, um, you know, it's almost axiomatic that when you go through your teenage years, it's, you know, and it's a real struggle and it can be alienating mm -hmm. and you can feel, you know, left out or lost or just confused. Mm -hmm. And the great thing when I started writing, it was just kind of, you know, by myself in my room with the door closed and you create an alternate reality, whether it's a poem or whether it's a character or whether you just like to put words on a page, which I do. And, you know, do the words make sense? Can I, can I make them better? I mean, these are thoughts that evolve as you get older, but, mm -hmm. but the habit forming aspect of it, um, it's, I think if you do it when you're young and that's why you keep writing for 50 years because you're sign, you're still looking to achieve something you haven't quite got there yet. Hmm. What are you trying to achieve now? Uh, so my thing about achieving is, um, is, creating the best characters and the best plot and even more important now especially in this book is i want to see if i can express my perspective on our country on mm. what's happening it's so different than what it was obviously in the 60s or 70s or 80s i mean you don't have to define a country by its decades but it's it's a helpful benchmark and um, in this book, I kind of say, you know, the 21st century got off to a rocky start. If you're talking about 9-11 and the terrorist mm -hmm. bombing in the world in the Twin Towers. And um, it, to me, it never found its legs again. Um, not that it's necessarily a bad thing. Technology came along. Social media came along. Mm -hmm. But terrorism, um, after we experienced the first attack on our home soil, um, not counting Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, so suddenly it's, it's like, you know, it's a different world. And um, like anything can happen at any time. Um, and you don't have the usual safety guards. You don't have a, assurances of leadership. Um, you see how the evolution of a political leadership has happened the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the, the change, the rapidity of change is uh, is unknown. It will be great. It will be greater than we're used to. Mm. And is your goal, like when you were writing this book, Cliffhanger, you know, you're, you're trying to express your perspective. Is it to figure out, like solve some puzzle for yourself? Yeah, I, th I think I think um, writing is part exploration. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you always learn something about yourself and um, your story and your characters um, that you you didn't when you wrote the first sentence. Um, so that's part of the goal. And then the the most important thing as you get older, I think the most satisfying thing is uh, is rewriting. Mm. And, and deliberately rewriting, not being satisfied uh, with something that you could have done five years ago. I want to do something that will be remembered five years from now. I want to be ahead of myself mm. in how I manipulate a story. Um, I keep saying the word characters, but everything is interlaid, right? It's all, it's all process. But th that's what gives me the most satisfaction. Mm. Well, let's deepen into that, like that satisfaction and rewriting. Is it just the overall craft or is there like, like 
just taking us through, take us through maybe like your iterations on your latest book, like what you focused on and if you're willing. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, well, okay. So there's, there's a theme, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the theme is, as I said earlier, the 21st century uh, is beginning to be quite different and um, more unpredictable than the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So um, so my theme is like, okay, um, I wanted to create a story that would reflect people looking back, in this case, the history teacher, a 60-year-old history teacher, and the young man and young woman running against each other for student body president. The year is 2030, and the world and the United States is in even worse shape mm -hmm. than it was at 9-11, than it was in the economic crash of 2008, than it was in the um, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and you just better be careful. And and the heroine, the young woman, um, she is um, not risk adverse. She is curious about everything. She does not play it safe. Mm -hmm. And so when she looks back on history and what she sees from it and what she extrapolates what the future might be like, it's a very interesting point of view. Uh, my expression is she's not afraid to open unmarked doors. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will say, oh, no, why, oh, I don't wanna, why don't I want to go there? That's just, you know, that's the unknown. That's, that's trouble. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but she doesn't look at it that way. She looks at that's the future. That's answers. And she's running against a young man who is just a, um, a charismatic and he's a, you know, he's a football player and, he, and he's, he's bright enough, not as bright as the young woman, but he has his own perspective on what the 20th century is and 21st century. And it's very different than hers. It is that it's, um, it's going to be uh, an age of um, AI. It's going to be an age of um, manipulation um, it's it's going to be a, a place where the economy that we used to assume for granted, America is the greatest country or has the greatest economy, that's no longer true. Mm -hmm. right? It's it's China, and uh, what does that mean now to be a second a second class nation? I mean, what is your definition of yourself? So um, I'm sort of meandering here. I did that. Did that answer the? Um, well, the question? yeah. Well, we were talking about like the revision. So it sounds like. Yes. You, know, you write you write a first draft and you're by that point you're probably pretty solid on what your theme is and then when you go back over and and get into that rewriting right you're right. you're trying to tighten and 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 squeeze out things that don't serve the the central conflict there which i guess is the perspective the differing perspectives on the world and what to yeah. do yeah, I think um, there's different kinds of rewriting, right? Yeah. Um, but um, the most important one um, is you're is you're you're trying to make your points sharper, mm -hmm. uh, realistic by putting them in the right context, um, having the characters interact as as their character arcs change. You know, how many times do their character arcs uh, interact? Uh, I mean, these these are the the layers of uh, that I think are a good story. Um, and um, you only achieve them by willingness to, to rewrite it. And then maybe you stop and put it away in a drawer for a couple of months and you go back to it. And that helps a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, you can never be through rewriting if you, if you want to, because there's no such thing as a perfect book, <laughs> but, um, but it's not so much perfect. It's like, how you can make the best book you can make. Hmm. Yeah. Well, at what point in your process do you start to let feedback in? Uh, I really don't like to talk about a book at all while it's being written, especially in its first draft. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just too fragile. Mm. Um, you know, it's like a pregnancy in the first trimester, mm. you know, you, it feels good in the beginning and you hope it, Hope it continues well. But uh, if you start talking about it and someone says, oh, I read a book like that, or they say, you know, I don't think that's as good as if you did something else. And they're they're messing with your creativity. And your mm -hmm. creativity is a very fragile thing, um, mm. if, even in rewrites, but especially in first drafts. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Is that a lesson that you had to come by? Like, uh, Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, because when you're when you're younger and someone says, well, well, what are you working on? And like, you you know, you just kind of, you know, blab it out and don't think about it. And and you don't think about the impact of the feedback. You mm-hmm. didn't necessarily want feedback. Mm-hmm. If you didn't want feedback, then you should have been very selective in who you talked to and how you phrased your question, right? Because it's, it's crazy what, how, what people can respond to in, in a painting or a movie or a yeah. book. And and it maybe not be what you intended at all, and then you could say, "Is that good or is that bad?" Yeah, and maybe that's maybe that's a problem with social media. I see this a lot, where maybe somebody's sharing something, but they're not looking for feedback, like they're in that no, fragile no. place, and and somehow sharing something with the ability to comment on it draws all sorts of you know I, unsolicited I, I, feedback. Do, do you think that the, the main objective of, of most people on social media is to get their voice heard, right? Um, I mean, they may want responses that might mean what they say is important. Yeah. But I, I just think in a, in a society that is so diverse now and the opportunities to express your diverse opinions, it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of irresistible. Um, it means there's also a lot of conflict and anger. Um, it's a mixed bag, but, mm-hmm. uh, but social media is not going away and mm-hmm. um, the communication channels will only expand. Um, the question is, do, is the novel going to be part of that bandwidth? Yeah. Um, when we can communicate and how will it be a part of that? Do you use social media as far as like for, for business or promoting your books and that sort of thing. Oh, I, yeah, I do. I, I, I have someone that, um, a publicist that, um, I mean, you're, you're, you know, in this, in this very competitive world of, of so many books out there in, in the age of self-publishing, mm-hmm. you try to stand out and, you know, um, if you get maybe the right reviewers or the right readers or uh, somebody, you know, picks it up unexpectedly and says, I like to make it into a movie, um, that sometimes happen, but not often. And you really can't count on it, but you do it to do the best you can. And then you say, all right, that's what the publicist can do. All I can do is write the best book that I can write. So that's where you put your focus, you outsource. Yeah, I think you have to. Yeah. To, to, be, to get satisfaction, if you're going to be worried about, oh, you know, I need to get this published or um, I want this to, you know, be talked about. I mean, the whole fame thing, um, Andy Warhol and the 15 minutes of fame. Well, now it's like endless fame. Um, if you go on, you go on enough social media sites, it's, it's daunting. It's, um, mm. it's like, do I want to be part of this world? And sometimes the answer is no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and since you've started, obviously the landscape has changed tremendously, not only culturally, but the business of writing and publishing. Um, right. So, so you obviously had to go through traditional publishing route to start. So did that... Yes. Was that a difficult process to start with, or did you find difficulty with that? Well, in the beginning, uh, compared to now, uh, if we're going back far enough, it was relatively easy to get published if you were at all a decent writer in that I, I was living in New York at the time. I believe there had to be 20, 25 mainstream publishers hmm. that you would, you know, like to, any one of them would be suitable. And now I think we're, the world is down to five or six, mm-hmm. right? So the alternative for most writers is is not to, I mean, if you might get lucky and someone might publish a book, it doesn't mean it's going to sell. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. It means you might have, you know, bragging rights to saying, look, Random House published my book and it might get some credibility with reviewers, mm-hmm. but um, it's, it's not necessarily um, the only way to, to, to satisfy yourself with, with a reading public. Your self-publishing, I think, is becoming more and more legitimate. Yeah. Is that something that you've, that you've been leveraging in recent years? Well, I, I mean, the, for the, I've written 20, 23 or 24, I published 23 or 24 books. Mm-hmm. And I think the first 
uh, 18 or 19 were mainstream. And my publisher was either Doubleday or uh, then it became Random House Penguin. Um, but as you know, as the, as the demands on publishers to make money um, increased, um, either they went out of business or they had to find bestsellers. They had to find books that people like to read. Mm-hmm. And so then we entered a world of, of genre-oriented fiction, if we're talking about fiction for a second. So are you, or do you write um, um, historical novels, romantic novels, detective, police novels? Uh, you know, everybody gets pigeonholed. And um, it's disappointing to me that if some people like only one author or only one genre, and that's fine, and that brings them pleasure, and hopefully it means selling a lot of copies for the publisher. But um, I find when I go outside of my interest lane, there's a whole diversity of worlds and writing styles that I really enjoy, and I've never really heard of these writers except a friend recommends them. Hmm. So, so there's a lot of interesting writers out there that just you know aren't household names. I, you know, see is the word pigeonholed and and looking at the trajectory you know the breadth of genres you've written in and types of books i get the sense that's something that you don't want (laughs) to be pigeonholed no i i i just you know there's some people that like to write um the same genre or the same detective or whatever you Mm -hmm. know over and over and some of them are really great writers i'm not demeaning that at all Mm -hmm. i'm just saying personally um i'm just too um eclectic or autodidactic to um to to want just to do one thing yeah Uh, did that did that make it harder to pitch your ideas as you went along yes 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 definitely i mean my 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 illustration of that is when I wrote Abingdon's, that was the it became a bestseller, and um, and I had a two book contract with Doubleday, mm-hmm. and um, they said, "What do you what are you going to write for your second book?" And I went off on this whole thing about uh, testing the atomic bomb in the, in the Nevada desert because my father was part of that, and you know, and they kind of there was a silence and and. and, <laughs> and I said, what what uh no 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 michael no no just you know stick to this all right stick to another abingdon's so you know i felt uh, you know it was a little bit of pressure to do it and they wanted it and so they said you know what's popular right now and i said well i you know i kind of know i said well studio 54 do you, do you remember any of those days i mean they're they're long gone now mm-hmm. but studio 54 in the uh, 70s was the happening place uh, drugs were everywhere and steve rubel was running this thing and every celebrity in the world wanted to go there and mm-hmm. lined up outside the bouncer or the or the host you know if he didn't know you or you didn't have credentials you couldn't come in yeah so, so that was the way to treat the story right uh, the exclusivity of it and what happens if you get in and you don't belong and you're a poser and you want to belong so it was it was it was an okay story but it it wasn't from deep in my heart mm. so i i wouldn't call it one of my favorite outputs yeah you know? it yeah. was just responding to the commercial world do you do you feel that you can write a great book if you're not all the way invested in it no i think at this point in my life um i need and i and, and i can be at this point in my life fully invested what people don't what some people don't realize is that okay you want to be a writer and you you you're trained or you go to a good school or you're naturally talented or whatever, but you know, suddenly you know, things get in the way, right? You get married or you have kids or you have to, uh, you can't make enough money from your books. So you have an eight to five job mm-hmm. and you're, you're this universe, which is constantly swirling around you. You kind of say, well, I got to stop this. I got to find a place. I got to find the time, you know, that I can devote to writing without being distracted by so many other domestic duties. Mm-hmm. And that's hard. That is really hard. That leads to writer's block. I mean, if you're mm-hmm. trying to serve too many masters, I'm just speaking for myself. It's you don't produce you don't produce your best fiction. Mm. 
so no, you, think, and, you think writer's block writer's block is a function of more your environment and and yeah i i think everybody's different i mean my i'm an add type right so um yeah, it's easy for me to get distracted if I have too many things to do. I really, I usually have to focus on only one, but you can't afford to do that because timing of the other things are are important too. Right. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. So what's so, what's the trick you do now? Like, how do you? Well, now I'm retired. Yeah. Right? Well, that helps. There you go. Uh, that helps a lot, and um, my brain, um, knock on wood, is still agile. And um, uh, I believe in getting a good night's sleep. I'm, I'm a morning person. Uh, so I write, I try to write at least four to five hours and it's usually the morning hours. And um, that seems to be working out well. I think the level of my storytelling um, is improving. So that's, that keeps me going. Hmm. Hmm. So you've done other things beyond you know, writing fiction. So, you know, like you mentioned biographies, there's art criticism, there's screenplays. And, like, and my son and I made two movies together and, and Amazon Prime picked them up. They're, oh, not, nice. they're not like, um, you know, the girl with the dragon tattoo, but um, but they're interesting. And um, I, I'm not as skilled in writing screenplays as I would like to be, but you learn pretty quickly the difference between the written page and the spoken word. Mm. Um, and that's a, another way of teaching yourself a skill you didn't have before. So that's very interesting to me. Is that something you're actively working on now? That no, skill? No, no, not right. No, not right now. I mean, the film world is, is, is so, um, no, no, no. What, I mean, it's very claustrophobic. It's very um, insider ish. Um, um, the streaming thing, I mean, Netflix and Amazon, they all Hulu, they, they hire their own cadre of writers. Uh, they very much control the production process. Mm -hmm. Um, some good things are being made. Um, I, I, I salute the, the, the industry for that. Uh, but it's not for me. It's just, I mean, I'd rather be, I'm the go it alone type. Is there anything you learned from the process of of learning screenwriting and doing it that that you could take back to your writing f for books? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I tend to write very visually. Mm -hmm. So when I write something, I imagine it in my head, even if it's a piece of exposition in a novel, even if it's, you know, a, a point of digression, uh, that it's not exactly a, a visual scene. I, I, I relate it to seeing those characters discussing a point of exposition, let's say, or I relate it to um, something in the plot that's very easy to visualize. Um, so, you know, and I hope the reader can do that too, because I think that's another way to make the glue stronger in that writer reader relationship. You want to give the reader as much help as possible to retain and enjoy your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. And well, tell us about, since you mentioned it, the movies on Amazon Prime, you can you can name drop a few. Um, well, I, I see. I think they're both on still. I mean, one was uh, the first one was Intersection, mm -hmm. and it uh, it won a bunch of um, not major festivals, but a lot of independent, like forty five independent festival awards for best film. Or you know, it's not a profound film, but it's an emotional film, mm -hmm. and I like dealing with characters who face really tough obstacles, who are underdogs, who are determined to solve their own problems, but rarely can, mm -hmm. um, who think they're taking the right path and then their heart is broken. Um, life is all about starts, fresh starts, false starts, starts that you have to repair, uh, new paths that you end up on and you're not sure they're the right ones. So, um, you know, if you can imbue your your characters with with some of those attributes, you know, it makes it makes it kind of interesting. Uh, and the second book, a second book, the second novel, the second movie 
uh, is that is still playing and, and actually is making money. Um, it's called Reunion, and it's about um, a high school reunion when something happened in high school that was hushed up. Mm. And, um, and now, ten years later, one of the victims of that uh, event, um, you know, can't live with herself anymore. And she wants some justice and she wants some clarity. Um, and every all these seven or eight people that come back for this reunion had something to do with that incident. Hmm. So um, the, 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 the deity of that piece of writing would be, well, how do you how do you, you know, spool out those, you know, the information for the viewer? Um, we don't want to give the story away, but you don't want anybody to get stalled and bored. Um, so which character speaks when and what they say and what are the stakes? How, how dramatic and important are the stakes of the people who were involved in this incident now in the future? Not just when it happened, but now. So, so you have to make sure you find those stakes and make yeah, them compelling well, enough. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you sure try. Yeah, yeah. Well, did you, so you wrote screenplays for those. Did you have additional roles? Because I know making films is an involved process that involve, <laughs> that usually has a, a team. Uh, oh my God, it's it's totally different, right? It's, yeah. yes, you're right. It's a team sport, yeah. and um, and you're as strong as the, <laughs> as the weakest link on your team, yeah. right? I mean, everybody from whatever uh, the person that that not just not only writes the screenplay, but the, obviously the photography and the editing, yeah. and um, and you just you never know what's going to happen. You, um, I was starting to read the book on the making of. Um, Chinatown, mm -hmm. which is one of the great movies of the 20th century. Yeah. And um, the four personalities who were trying to work together, you know, had separate visions of what the final product should be. And, uh, you know, it was... Um, yes, there were some distinctly different versions of... <laughs> Uh, of that movie yes in script yeah, so, form so, you know so it's really hard to imagine when you have four people that are all talented and all powerful and have influence that uh, how are they going to know each one when to push their point or when to subordinate their point to somebody else um i mean jack nicholson i think was the one that kept that the movie to going but um uh, polanski who was the director um the, according to this book is like you know, what planet is he on? You know, we're trying to tell a story about Owens Valley and the supply of water to Los Angeles and, and with a background of, you know, family dysfunction. Um, and, you know, but somehow it came out, you know, and kudos to, to that team. Yeah. And every, every once in a while, I mean, um, people will look at a movie and they say, oh, that doesn't work. What, how could they make that mistake? And, you know, there could be a hundred reasons. You don't have control of the process. You run out of money. The writer quits. The actor quits. You know, it's a, it's, it's a fragile process. Yeah. I was listening to us. There's a podcast, a podcast script notes, which has a couple prominent screenwriters and they were discussing, you know, some of these, some of these things with a more recent movie that um, but um so in your process like did you did you find somebody who's strong as a producer or, as a, or a director and you know rely on their judgment and team no, building no, or no, we, we were we were definitely a homegrown enterprise yeah I mean, well that's, money, that money takes some issue. skills money money <laughs> you know money is an issue right yeah, um, yeah. and you really can't make a decent film today I think for less than half a million, our budget was 110,000. Yeah. That was an 18 day shoot. So mm -hmm. you're putting up people in motels. You're hoping they're not destroying the motels and the, and the, and the, per <laughs> the manager comes after you and someone turns out they're a vegetarian and you would, you know, prepare another dish that night. And I, you know, there's just all these little things and yes. you're not just the director, you're just sort of like the, um, uh, the manager of this whole process, you're, yeah. you're the arbiter of, you know, what can be done and what can't, and you're not always sure of your judgment, you know, yeah. but the money says, okay, it's your job, but you got, you got to do it yourself. Yep. Yeah. That's kind of like, I've, I've bankrolled, I bankrolled, well, 
yeah, a handful of music videos back from my days as oh. you know doing music stuff, and it was very insightful. It's a it's a lower cost way to learn how the how, the, how filmmaking works. Yeah, that's a, that's like a writer writing a short story. Before yeah, it's like three to five before. minute, you know, yeah. Yeah. piece. Which it, it it yeah. So teamwork, <laughs> trusting people. It's a different mindset than being and writing a novel, but even in writing a novel, right? You, you, to some limited degree, you have your relationship, say, with your agent or with your editor, mm-hmm. right? And so, maybe talk about like how how your experience was working with editors. Well, um, gee, in a word, there are good editors, and there are some that are not a good match for you. Mm. And um, and they and sometimes an editor will have a certain way of envisioning what you like to call your story, but they're now saying, okay, once they they put their fingerprints on the page, and the publisher agrees to publish the book, it too, like a movie, becomes a collaborative effort. Yes. Um, and like a director, to continue the analogy, in a movie, you always hear about the director fuming about you know his his best scene was cut and right and if you're a great director and and have influence you get to make a director's cut which means it's exactly the studio that's exactly what you wanted and it's the same thing with agents and books um i've had some good agents that made some suggestions about um, restructuring or whatever and i thought they worked and then if the agent makes what you think is not a a really uh winning (laughs) winning idea you have to really argue for yourself and mm. and, and fight for it mm. it's almost combat so you know you met, mentioned you know an editor can be not a good match for you like that i assume they're still good at your job so is it a question of taste or perspective on storytelling in general okay it could be uh well definitely it could be perspective on on storytelling i mean someone can say and i really would dislike this if they said this why uh, michael why did you take the the point of view of of that character you know um you could have explained him uh through the eyes of a of the his love interest and it would have been a much more interesting story and by the way most of our women most of our readers are women and they like to read about you know uh, female heroines Mm -hmm. so you you go through that dance about the commerciality of the project versus what you see as 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 its main ingredients yeah boy if i were going through the process i would hope to have that ironed out before i started (laughs) started working with them um you, you mean iron out the relationship with the editor, or yeah, the, or the the perspective on what the book's going to be, who the who the you point try, of view, yeah. Well, you, you try to do that, and and you you're going to go on the assumption that they wouldn't want the book unless it was essentially you know something on their list that they think they can they can sell. Yeah. Um, but um, and and th- those are generally good editors. They they don't mess around. And today, my experiences with editors. Um, they don't mess around at all. They they just say you know they have a copy editor look at your manuscript for for grammatical errors, let's say, but um, the story they're not going to mess with. And and one of my <laughs> one of my favorite stories about this is involves uh, Random House and Penguin, um, and they I think they were the publishers of Fifty Shades of Grey, mm-hmm. um, and that was a um, a self-published book and the no one says the writing was you know uh, Faulkner or Hemingway uh-huh. um, um, but um, they they recognize that the theme you know the the thing the bondage or soft poor or whatever you want to say there was a reader base for that out there and um, they they bought that book for very little and, and they just go out the ocean of see all these possible titles and they see that one and they something clicks in their head and, and says, OK. And the fact is that one book and its two sequels saved Random House's ass mm. financially. Mm-hmm. Random House had been running in the red for two or three or four years before they published the first um, Fifty Shades. And that book made so much money. Right. I think it outsold you know, 
Harry Potter or what any but you know anything else for for a brief period of time for for three to four or five years. But that gave the publisher breathing room, you hope, to take up and and select other books that are more serious. <laughs> you know, you have a balance. Yeah. Well, we, you know, you think about it from that side. It's a it's a risky business. You, oh, it's terribly risky. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same deal with song publishing and, and music artists, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I know some music producers, and um, they have talks about, you know, how do you recognize a great song, right? Yeah. And, and like, wow, that is really tough. And they all seem to say, they don't come along that often, you know. You, you can think of something. I mean, I'm not talking about established stars, but, yeah. you know, new talent coming up, right? And um, I was watching the Dylan biography, um, mm -hmm. No Direction Home, mm -hmm. which is really wonderful. Scorsese did that in a documentary, I think, in 05 or 06, something mm -hmm. like that. And Dylan was very uh, forthright and articulate um, about how he created music. And he wasn't, quote, accepted, uh, even when he went back to New York, for about a year, a year and a half, um, until somebody, you know, heard him and said, gee, I really like that sound. It's, you know, it's not just Woody Guthrie, it's got kind of a Midwest twang to it. And anyway, they, so suddenly he went from the bottom of the pile where he was passed over on many auditions for the coffee houses to the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you couldn't get enough of him. And I think he, you know, he, according to the documentary, you know, he struggled with that transition uh, and he, he wasn't, you know, used to it. And, um, you know, he, I think he lost his way for a little bit. Was it, you, you know, I assume a lot of this applies to our own journeys and your journey, I would imagine, you know, you can't, you don't know which books are going to be received as great and memorable right or you know they don't or, all turn out that way no no and and sometimes they're received indifferently and it could still be a good book it's just a question of the what the what the public appetite is for your subject matter or your characters or or your theme i mean in, in writing this political novel i don't expect it to sell very well because people either hate politics with justifiable reasons, or they love politics. And um, if you love politics, you got to be, you know, you got to be used to compromising. You got to be used to uh, doing things that are not 100% ethical. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way the system goes. And you can have all the ideals in the world, but it's not going to make you a great politician. Mm. Um, some will help. So, um, yeah, so you write a book and, and it's important that it's, that it's good to you. It's good for you. It's something that you are proud of for whatever reason, um, uh, the way you explored the subject or you like the characters. And then, you know, then the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to find that perspective? <laughs> um, that, that chips fall? Chips yes. Fall where they yes. May? Yeah. Well, after, you know, after a number of books or, um, or following other writers, I mean, very few writers have a uh, smooth glide path. Um, I mean, the, I mean, I think John le Carre is an exception to that. Obviously, he doesn't write a bad book. Um, um, Peter Mathiasen. I mean, it's like, but, but most people, and, and not to bring up the ghost of Ernest Hemingway too often, but, you know, he, he started out great uh the sun also rises um and uh i forget what was next farewell to arms or but he had two or three hits in a row mm -hmm. and um and he was suddenly the great american writer he was he was perceived as that he was ordained as that by critics and um you know you would think he had it made but he was undone uh he created um what ken burns calls an avatar of himself he would make up stories about the Italian front when he was with the ambulance corps in the uh, First World War. Um, and and then every time he would tell a lie and he would have to stick with it. And I think that diminished him by saying, why did I have to pretend to be someone I'm not? Mm. And then his writing deteriorated. Yeah. Well, and so 
Abingdon's, that was an early work of yours, right? Yeah, quite early. I think and it was 1979. So what was that like having a best-selling novel and then trying to follow that with the books well, that followed? It, it was intoxicating uh, because um, not only was that a bestseller, but I had written a, y, a young adult book at the same time published by Delacorte. And both books were reviewed in the New York Times, in the Sunday magazine section mm-hmm. of the New York Times. And they were both favorable reviews. So then you start getting like, oh, wait a minute, um, uh, can I handle this? Um, <laughs> you know, it put a lot of pressure on you. Um, I wished it hadn't happened at that stage because then suddenly you're not as sure of your footing as you were when you have people expecting, you know, a certain kind of book or a certain number of sales, you know, it's pressure. Yeah. So, so what is that like? Did that, do you think that pressure had an impact on your joy in the writing process or the stories you told? Yeah, I think it really it, um, it unhinged me to an extent. Uh, it led to some writer's block. And then if you combine that with living a, quote, normal life of raising a family and having a job uh, and still finding time to write, um, it, it it it's it's not easy and and i i'm i'm grateful now to you know have the time to um really devote myself um mm. without any excuses <laughs> you know, and see what i can do well it sounds like it's easier if <laughs> if you've gotten to the point where you know, you've accepted that what happens after you write and publish the book is somewhat outside your control right yeah and 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 you get you get encouraged by stories of famous people who have failed yeah right great writers who have failed i'm always like how do they deal with that so i'm thinking like herman melville you probably maybe you know this story Mm -hmm. right so he writes moby dick and um i think the publisher begrudgingly published it it was 500 copies they were stored in a warehouse. Uh, fire destroyed 200 copies of the 500. Um, and the ones that were left, you know, he got disseminated to a couple of critics. And um, no, no great shakes. No one, no one said anything. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a tale of uh, Captain Ahab chasing the white whale. And what is the white whale? I mean, I mean they didn't go into the, the depth that he put into it as you know as a philosopher and existentialist but now of course history has you know corrected that and swung the other way so it's always when you hear those stories it's like don't feel you're all alone you know Mm. this is something you know that can happen to the best of us yeah Yeah. (laughs) it's true and i don't know about you but there have been phases in my my creative life where you know obviously inspired by seeing the success of others Mm -hmm. and wanting to know how somebody who got to the top of the pile you know how they did it Mm -hmm. and and do you find that did you find a point in your journey that like you also made that success of others be your own bar for success oh uh, oh certainly i mean um uh, if if a book is successful and it's something that as a subject matter you might tackle, I definitely want to read that book and see what the author did. Right, mm-hmm. and I'm not intending to emulate it. I'm not intending to you know um, say this is the greatest book of all time. But um, it's it's interesting what makes one book um, really noteworthy and another one maybe on the same subject and could have interesting characters, but not, it doesn't capture the, the public reader imagination that you hope. So, so, so the part of being a detective, if you're a writer is like, and we love getting together with five or six of us in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, mm. we get together and we always discuss what we're reading and mm-hmm. why we liked it or movies and why we didn't like them. And, and um, why, what's the basis of your opinion? That's what's most important. What is your thinking behind a particular reaction? Mm, yeah, that's that's important. Yeah, and and of course you are an audience, and you're not everybody, <laughs> which is why it's right. interesting to compare and contrast how 
how we're received. Right, right. Um, I'm sorry, did you want me to... No, I mean, you know, if you, you can have a reaction if it's interesting. No, I, to, no, I just, I, I just think, yeah, I mean, if you, if you're, if you get your head too involved in the aspect of any kind of commercial aspect about the book, like if you, if you find yourself telling yourself, um, how can I make this a little more commercial? Hmm. Well, that's okay. You know, because you want to give the book the best chance of selling, but mm -hmm. you don't want to do some ploy that is so beneath you know, what you've already achieved on the, on the written page in 90% of the book. You don't want to have a stinker of an, of an ending um, just to say, you know, look, you, I tied up everything in ribbons, you know, you, because you may not want to do that. You probably don't want to do that. Um, so, you know, that's something you, you, you decide for yourself. Hmm. Yeah. And so you've also written biographies and self-help books. You know, right? And I how did. It, yeah. Well, first question would be like maybe focus on the biography piece. Um, like, what were the circumstances around that? I guess well, first. I mean, when you talk about biography, I should say um, uh, one one biography was of an artist named Frank Howell. So it was both a piece of uh, cri criticism, uh, constructive criticism of his art and a biography of his very unusual peripatetic life, mm -hmm. right? And then I did a couple of um, adaptations of adult books. And they, at this time, this is back in the early 90s, um, the, my editor would say, you know, we're, we want to do a young adult adaptation of this. Mm -hmm. So the kids who are 10 or 12, you know, you have to make the story shorter, you have you know cut back on some of the adverbs or whatever it is but you want it's a story that would appeal to kids if they could read it right so one was uh, flags of our fathers which was uh, a book by a gentleman named james brady and um he wrote the adult piece if you will but i wrote the young adult piece and it's been selling it's been 10 12 years and it still sells a lot of copies mm. So um, I'm trying to think what else um, uh, in terms of, bio well, then, yeah, then I've done other adaptations of like military heroes. Once you talk about getting pigeonholed, well, you did a book on flags of our fathers, which was about Iwo Jima in World War II. You know, you should be able to do a book about what's happening, eth ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Herzegovina, yeah, yeah. you know, so you write that and then that book sells a lot too. And you're saying, well, you know, it doesn't take that, me that much effort to write these books. You kind of got a built in advantage because they were bestsellers as adult fiction. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, and that is, is not a practice done much anymore because the difference between what a 12 year old can read and retain today versus 30 years ago is night and day. I mean, a good 12 year old reader, um, there's not much that he or she can't assimilate mm -hmm. as an adult, as an adult product, which we say. Yeah. So you know? the, the need, <laughs> the perceived need in the market is kind of yeah. gone. Yeah. 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 And that perceived need in the market is something that's like, well, what's that all about? You know, I mean, you get some editors and they think, okay, this is what's happening now among girls, right? And um, how they behave, uh, how do they rebel? How do they use social media? What do they do when they get angry? Um, that's always changing because your your methods of, of explaining yourself or portraying yourself change because the generation changes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what's ahead? What does 2021 and, and beyond well, I, hold I, for you? I'm going to finish this uh, this book that I can't, <laughs> I don't want to talk about. Yeah. I really like it. It's something that um, I haven't tackled before. It's like the difference between the East and the West, um, the Asian and, say, American uh, mindsets on, on certain things, uh, conflicts, on love, on betrayal. Uh, I tend to write page turners. I try to make at least the plot interesting enough that you want to get to the end. Um, and hopefully the end is going to satisfy what you had started at the beginning. Yeah. 
make good on your promise. So you're excited about that. Yeah, I am. And that um, you, you can tell when you when you think uh, when a book is good, I think, or um, if you get up in the morning, or for me anyway, when you get up in the morning, you can't wait to start writing, yeah. right? It's not like I'm going to make breakfast and call a friend and, you know, whatever. No, I, it's the first thing I want to do is that, you know, 6 a.m. I'm up and have a cup of coffee and you know, I try to write straight through. Hmm. Well, for people who want to know more about you, how can they find you? Oh, I think, what's the website? Uh, um, it's uh, michaelfrenchauthor.com and or michaelrfrenchauthor.com. And um, yeah, you can, you can find me easily. Cool. Uh, Those both go to the same place? Um, yeah, they, yeah, they both end up on the same site. And, cool. you know, that's got blogs and it's got books and it's got my opinion on, you know, what I think is important in, in our society today. And, and I've become quite interested in politics in the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I find that in this uh, a labyrinth, you know, that's spiraling. I don't know where it's spiraling. <laughs> so there's so many contributions to, you know, what, what, was, what is needed by whom that yeah. dictates the, the direction. Yeah. Well, it Michael, was, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Oh, uh, likewise, Ethan. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for having me. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Fearless Storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover The Fearless Storyteller podcast.